Um, I'm Nate Jackson. I'm a comedian. And uh, long story short. I take a drag at the square, I feel anxious, bit dangerous, it's the verbal of piss, it's reflecting my perspective, bit goggling fear, role model so hollow, shadow adolescence in the gaggle of them bitches. Dude is a beast, one of the best dudes out there doing it, I've been on the road with this dude, he's all over the country making people laugh, all over television, you know him, you see him, it's his first season on Wild Out, and I'm telling you, he's ripping, and he's a proud member of Omega Sci-Fi, y'all make some noise all the way from Seattle, Washington, give it up for my man Big Nate! Told me better, can't count on niggas, can't count on weather. Go figure, nigga, they ain't worried about this gender. Wow, there's a bald eagle. Big ass bald eagle, Jesus. too. What would be dope was if like I went like this and the motherfucker landed on my head. <laughs> <laughs> like, pre! <laughs> Get back up there. Freedom. Um, when you ask people who their favorite comic is, a lot of times they say the same three to five names. You get Chappelle, you get Kevin Hart, you get Bernie Mac, you get Richard Pryor. And then that fifth one is usually a toss up between Cat Williams or Mike Epps. And I think all of them rightfully should be people's favorites. Um, but I also think that it's high time people started getting some new favorites. We gonna go in here, he don't know we coming. It's just, it is what it is. We're going in. He only takes appointments on Fridays. So we're just gonna make an appointment now, I guess. Sam, you left the um, the open sign on though. Oh, no. How you doing? I shot you down. We met worshiping Jesus. That's how we met. So I'll kinda rise to his fame, to his newfound fame. But uh seeing him rise, you know, slowly but surely. Hometown hero, I guess that's what you would want to call him. That's like a whole hospital of babies all at once. And I don't mind that, but everybody was celebrating like they turned 21. So that's Nate right here. He's a man. They stole from the comics, they stole from other people who paid for tickets. People who had a bad experience tell four times more people the people who had a good experience. Somebody come in here and they get a bad haircut from another barber. Mm -hmm. They ain't gonna say that other barber. They're gonna say Sam did it. <laughs> Man, you need a church fan after that. You gotta put that on and blow it on people. Yeah. That's gotta be witch hair. <laughs> There's no way that's regular alcohol. Don't make a sound. <laughs> Right here. Oh, you said leaving like you were leaving, leaving. I'm going to Portland. Okay. You're interested in knowing some of the earliest stories mm -hmm. of Nate. Yeah. He's now Nate. He's always been known as Nathaniel to me. So I'll refer to him as Nathaniel occasionally. But there were glimpses of his interest in humor and comedy as far back as I can remember. I never connected it to a potential career uh, in comedy in any aspect. He was just a funny kid, you know, always with a sharp remark, uh, very original, very spontaneous. I can remember back an uh, 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 issue uh, came to my memory before he started kindergarten. He was uh, four and a half, five or whatever, still in preschool. And I had taken him with me to a friend's house for the weekend, uh, visiting her in her cabin. And uh, he began to play cards and just shuffling the cards and going on. And I said, where did you learn how to play cards like that? And he said, in preschool. And we just thought we would die laughing. It was, he just, just said it and kept shuffling. Like, so is that what I've been paying all this money to, 
send you to preschool to do, to learn to be a, a card shark. But just that kind of spontaneity uh, that would make you laugh and you think nothing of it to evolve into a professional comedian uh, is quite a joy on my part as his mother. The funniest one I can remember is that he, his ability to run track, he was generally the, the fastest running back in his uh, little league football for, on his team for quite a while. And of course he ran track. And we went to the great track for Eugene, Oregon. He had one of the best tracks in the country, if not the world. And he ran. And I remember he was very enthusiastic about going with great expectation. And he, he was doing really good. Now, he had been a winner. And in this one race, I think it maybe was a uh, hundred yard, a hundred meters, hundred yard dash or whatever, one hundred yard dash, whatever it was. But the key thing is that it was longer than the 100 yard dash, as a matter of fact. Because as he was coming into the ropes, he had fallen to next to the last kid in the race. And now this is a kid who thought he was really fast, and he was really fast, but these other kids sucked him up. And there was one little red-headed white guy behind him that was a little chubby. And he looked back at the little guy, and it, you could see very clearly that the worst nightmare he could have is this little chubby guy passed him. <laughs> and just as they were approaching the wire, the little chubby guy passed him. That was the end of his, his track career. <laughs> He, with this one old chubby white guy passed him. Now, uh, you say, yeah, he obviously had a feeling that he was faster than most white guys running track. And this little chubby white guy proved that he was totally wrong. <laughs> he beat him. So he retired at a very early age. <laughs> that was funny. But the reality is you do best what you do the most and what you're best at. You know, I jump rope very good, but people don't see what's behind the jumping. And it's like when Nate does his, his business, they see him on stage, they don't realize that he's working his heart out like a duck paddling below the water. You see him smoothly on top, but he's working on the knees, man, to get there. It's a lot of hard work and a lot of discipline. So jumping rope is the same way. So the way I got into comedy, um, I get asked so much that the answer is like streamlined. It's like it's like a canned answer now. But I was in college and I got dared. We used to sit every day in the union building and um, roast people, and talk smack and whatever, you know. And a friend of mine was like, yo, if there was like a comedy contest with just students in it, you think you could win? And I was like, hell yeah, I'll win. Like, who's funnier than me here? Like, all cocky. And he was like, oh yeah? I was like, yeah, he was like, turn around. And I turned around, there was this giant banner. I had came in that way, and the way it was hanging, I walked under it and never saw it. And it said, student only comedy competition. And I was like, fuck, I gotta write a joke or something, because this shit is next Wednesday. So that is essentially how I started doing comedy. I was on stage with a three by five card, performing with seven or eight other students at my school. and. I beat everybody except for the guy that dared me. Hey man, I'm doing an interview. I'm doing an interview that's turning into a come with me and see what I be doing shit and who I am and how I got how I am and it would be fucked up if I didn't have you hey. on this. Hey, 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 hey man. Call me back just a minute, man. I'm sitting in the car, man, in a thunderstorm, man. Oh, a tornado. A tornado. Call me back in just a minute, man. I gotta put this phone down and lighting and all that shit. Nigga, how do you, right. what city are you in? I'm in Louisiana, man. Call me right back in about 30 minutes. So I first started watching comedy at Dennis' house. 
too young to even understand what they were talking about, but everybody was laughing, so I was laughing too. And he's in Louisiana in a thunderstorm with lightning. I'm talking about calling back. So there's a mushroom farm, ostrums, right? Like the mushrooms that you eat at the grocery store. Mushrooms grow in manure. And the mushroom farm is basically a farm of doo-doo. And on Wednesdays, to like keep it the doo-doo fresh, they would stir it up. And so on Wednesdays, the whole middle school reeked every, like, un, like just like inside of a cow's ass. Like it was outrageous. But this is where I went to middle school at. His humor side has uh, gotten in the way of his schooling quite often. I felt some kind of way about the stuff they were teaching us, and I didn't have like the background or degrees to explain that I felt like we were learning some impractical things in school, but I would always like rage against the teachers or whatever. And so they made a special class in the portables where the principal of the school taught a class. And so like all of the bad kids, you call it whatever, would go, we'd have to go to her class. And she taught a class on manicuring your nails. And we all had to sit in there with her and learn about manicuring your nails. Oddly enough, some of the stuff I learned in the manicuring your nails class is more practical than some of the stuff I learned in the classes that I actually had. Like, imaginary numbers? Man, if you don't get the fuck out of here. Like, how about I just imagine the answer? What the fuck? And when is the last time anybody made a parabola? My dad was an entrepreneur and things were going better for him by the time, by the time I was nine, but at eight, you know, we, I didn't grow up with a lot of stuff. Like, I just, in that house. So it wasn't like I had a neighborhood and a bunch of kids to play with and stuff. Like, I had to just be really independent and just get your ass outside and play. Like, that was, I'm like, by myself, let the dogs out. Shit. <laughs> they didn't even care. These cedar fences are a new thing. Uh, they used to have these just regular wooden fences. And it stopped about right here and went straight across. And there was this girl at school that was talking so bad about this girl. I'm not gonna say no names. Well, this girl was talking so bad about this this little, let's say, this little Asian girl who was like really popular. She was gorgeous. She was making fun of like like one of the more brawn, brawny black girls every day and just nagging her down. And even though she was smaller, she was the bully. And one day after school, it was like, catch me up at the at the River Ridge Apartments, right? Because it's River Ridge High School and then River Ridge Apartments. And they were right here and they fought and then the big girl pushed the little girl down and the little girl fell and the big girl had her hands on top of the fence and was stomping on her like until we had to pull her off. And then everybody ran all off and they ran and got on buses and all went and police were trying to talk to people the next day. Like she, we didn't see a goddamn thing. River Ridge High School. Played on the track team, the football team, the baseball team, everything but soccer. And um, I got out of here with a 2.3 GPA, I think, maybe 2.7, I don't remember. But I got a full academic scholarship to Florida Memorial College in Miami. And people to this day ask, like, how do you get a full scholarship with a 2. Point anything? And so in Washington, a lot of the high schools have what's called the senior project. And so as a senior, you have to do something. You have to say this is, you have to make a project on something, uh, occupation or something you want to do. And you have to do research and stuff. And so what I did was because my cousin Dennis was a landscaper, um, I would always do landscaping. My dad always had me working in mowing lawns and stuff. Um, I did mine on landscape architecture and me and half the football team came out here two days before I had to do my senior project and we landscaped the front of the school. So this part right here where it says home of the hot, all of that in there, I, I did that. And so we were out here until like four o'clock. I would say we were probably here until two o'clock in the morning. And we had backed up, I got all the stuff sponsored by like gravel companies and stuff. Like I was like, yo, I'm just a student, this is what I'm trying to do. I only, I only, I only need a few feet, I gotta get covered. And can you donate? And they all said yes. 
and they backed all the trucks up and gave us big piles like right here and that's why we had to scramble so hard the last two days because if school started there would have been shit all over the sidewalk and we wouldn't have had classes smooth you know so we came out here we had cars we opened the doors and we were all we all put it on Q93 and we all bumped music and we had pizza ordered and like we were just kicking it and everybody was working and we got it done and it had a full package that showed what I wanted to do I had drawn it up on a computer like from bird's eye view and showed how I got things donated when the deliveries were and put it in and I got a perfect 20 out of 20 and it's usually like I don't know it's usually only like two or three per year and you expect that like the valedictorian is one of them and then like somebody else who's had phenomenal grades usually two 4.0 students or 4.0 3.9 or something and here I was with a 2.3 it never bothered to change it they just it looks like they got rid of my sign that said my name but these are the rocks that we spread 17 years ago and I remember because um, I had everything donated and then my uncle was like, you got something to lay down on there before you put the rocks on? I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, you gotta have, they got some material they put down over so that the weeds don't come through. And so uh, we had to go back and get it. But this is that, this is the stuff. And it just came on big rolls and like you stood on one end, we unroll all the way and then you just layer it. And then you put the rocks on top. I'm tripping that that's still there. Like, that's berserk, bro. And we used to sit right in here and talk shit. There was these tables that would pull out, and every morning we'd come in here and you'd get your breakfast from right there, and we would beatbox on the tables, like, like thump or with a pencil and be trying to rap. We were all trash, but we thought we were dope. Hey, nobody in here. These teachers up here doing some weird shit. A lead car, whoever's house it was, would be like, all right, I'm here, let's roll. And then we would go 50 cars deep or whatever, just following in a big, long-ass line to where the party was going to be. And that shit worked for years until the cops figured out where we were going at Safeway, and they'd be in the parking lot chilling, too. And then when everybody got to leaving, they would be in the damn end of the line going to the same house we're all going to and spoiling the party before we even got going. And there was another girl that lived across the street over there and we used to always have this joke about it because the street is actually called Ho Street. And the girl lived on Ho Street. And I lost my virginity on Ho Street. And there's a couple of other people who lost their virginity on Ho Street. What happened was uh, the mom had an extra high bed. And so it was like the perfect height that with the girl laying on it and me standing, it was the perfect height. And the wall, the bed was so close to the wall that she put her feet on the wall around me and I didn't have to do anything. I was, I, I, so, in a sense, I beat the brains off this girl and it was my first time. Like, I didn't have to do anything but just push a little bit and the bed was doing all the work. And I seen her about two years ago at a barbecue and I told her, I was like, you know, I lost my virginity to you. She was like, there's no way. that There's just no way. Like, you were, a, there's no way. Not the way you were doing it. And I was like, I promise. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just standing there. Just happy to see you. Yeah, I have a story. You do? I do. Okay, we can okay. hear you. He was living in Southern California, working a day job at a bank, driving to LA at night, and I think the commute was anywhere for, from an hour to an hour and 15 minutes every each way. And he was contemplating that time in your career when your job is holding you back, but the money's not in the bank to cover the funds. And he called me and said, you know, should I quit my job? And I said, absolutely, you should quit your job. This is gonna work. You need to move to LA. And he said, but you don't understand, in the, comedy sh in the comedy shows down there, I'm going to be competing with the likes of Tommy Davidson and Jamie Foxx. And I said, but Nathaniel, you'll be there to compete. And he said, no, you don't understand. If I'm, in the, if I'm there and I'm up, because he was still up and coming. He was still the pre-pre-comic, whatever they call that, before the headliner, that's going to try 
to get, you know, three to five minutes on the mic. He said, I, if, if Jamie Foxx is in there, if one of the Wayne brothers are in the club, I'll get bounced. And I said, but you will be in the club with them to get bounced. It's a risk you have to take. As his mother, it also pleases to me to see the kind of young man he has developed into to see his moral and ethical character, to see his core values remain with him. Um, I understand the social pressures of a young artist in this environment and to see that he's remained true to his beliefs and to see that his upbringing, uh, his small town upbringing reflects in the kind of person he's become. So a parent never knows what to expect uh, when their children grow up. Uh, and blossom into uh, adults. So I'm very pleased with the young man that uh, Nathaniel has continued to be. A well-rounded comic now is different than a well-rounded comic in the past. Like now you have to be good in Hollywood, good on the road. You have to be, you know, with the national exposure, you have to have TV, film, commercials, something, you know, popping. You gotta be great on the internet and you have to have a local presence somewhere. For some people, that is the Hollywood stuff. But most of the comics in Hollywood aren't from Hollywood. So what you have back home matters. You know what I mean? And um, by the grace of God, I managed to have all four of those things. They're looking okay right now. You know, he has a lot more in him. Uh, it's good that he's where, he's where he is, but he has a lot more in him. And I think if he keeps managing his life and managing the process the way he's doing, um, you know, I think that will will certainly uh, culminate. In our family, uh, we have a success legacy. That's what we do. Uh, I think he knows that. Uh, you have to put forth uh, all the effort and the hard work uh, and the smarts. Uh, to make it happen, and that is your disposition and treatment of people. Uh, obviously in life, it's a part of your success, how you treat people. You know, the best, the worst, the whole thing is a part of your success because it's all in that circle of success. You have to learn how to deal with successful people, you have to learn how to, learn how to deal with mediocre people, and you have to learn how to deal with bad people. And so, I think it's something that we're, we're extremely proud of. I know as a father, I'm extremely proud. Uh, I, I, I don't have the words to express how proud I am of it. I'm at in my career, this is the season of before. This is the before things take off. Humbly I'm saying that. Because um, things are picking up in a way I haven't seen before. Yeah. Now everybody telling me a lie. Know they give me something for my soul. See I don't want to think of suicide. So please don't take the lucky on my door.